to the power of God, I, I don't know, but there are people God is raising to become mighty vessels. I just saw an anointing rest on you, this role. In the name of Jesus, I don't know where you are, but I pray may that grace now, let it rest upon you and shift you to a new dimension. In the name of Jesus Christ. Welcome to Christocentric Message. On this channel, you are going to get soul-lifting messages, faith-based content, prayer drills, and videos that would help you grow spiritually. Remember to subscribe to the channel, like the video you are about to watch, and comment on it. Let's pray. Father, speak to our hearts tonight. And I pray that you walk mightily in our midst this night to the glory of the name of Jesus. I pray, O oh God, that your word will come with power and with clarity. And I pray that the sick will be healed tonight. Let the oppressed be delivered. And let Jesus be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. God bless you. Please be seated. It's my joy to again bring the word of the Lord tonight. We're looking at the subject of God's mercy and I pray that the Lord would open our eyes the more tonight in Jesus' name. At my initial session yesterday, we began to talk about a few things. I want to make a very quick recap. Um, number one, I said to truly understand the subject of God's mercy, we will need to examine, number one, the nature of God. That it is difficult to truly understand the subject of mercy until you understand the nature of God. Number two, that you need to understand the nature of man. There is something about man being the chief recipient of God's mercy. You will have to understand the nature of man to help you understand his mercy. Hallelujah. Theologically speaking or doctrinally speaking, you would need to really understand theology, the study of God, his nature, anthropology, the study of man, and then soteriology, the entire exegesis of the subject of salvation, beginning from the fall of man, for you to fully comprehend the subject of God's mercy. And um, we also discussed the fact that um, the mercy of God is predicated upon his love, his compassion, that the mercy of God is a derivative of his compassion, his love. That it is impossible to be able to show mercy until you have compassion. Mercy is the fruit of compassion. Are we together? Very important to understand this. And then we did establish yesterday how that there are two expressions to mercy. Number one has to do with forgiveness and withholding punishment from he or she that is guilty, worthy of condemnation, worthy of destruction. The first expression of mercy has to do with forgiveness and then withholding punishment from him that it is due. But the second expression of mercy has to do with alleviating pain. You have to understand that. It has to do with providing relief and the recipient of that dimension of mercy does not have to be someone who has caused offense. Anybody who is weak, incapacitated, and not sustaining the ability to help himself is deserving of mercy from that angle. Are we together? It is very important that we understand this dimension so that, number one, we can posture ourselves properly to be recipients of God's mercy to the fullest, and then that in communicating mercy, we know the dimensions that are required of us to give. Are we together? Until now, the subject of mercy is always looked at from the angle of the sinner and one who is deserving or in need of forgiveness. But that is only one expression of mercy. 
if we approach mercy just from a standpoint of pardon and withholding punishment from the guilty, it would not fully capture the essence of the subject of mercy. So from a broad, a broad perspective, you see that everyone requires the mercy of God to make progress in life. If the guilty and the sinner, then you require pardon. Is that true? And then if weak and inadequate, you require strength that will be able to push you forward. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord will help us tonight. And um, I told us that for my session, I'll be looking at two things. Number one, the concept of mercy. Can you just put the volume down a bit, please? It's too loud. Thank you. No, not the volume of the keyboard now. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Number one, we have to understand the concept of mercy. And then number two, and that's what I'll be doing in this session, the system of administering mercy. I told us that it is not just enough to understand the concept. You must understand the administration of mercy. How mercy is administered from God to men and from men to men. Because if we only understand the concept, we will appreciate it, but never be able to experience it. There is a spiritual technology for administering mercy. And this is what I hope that we'll understand tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. There is a weakness in man especially the fallen man by reason of the fallen nature and the consequences of the fallen nature upon man there is a weakness that is inherent in man that will perpetually necessitate the mercy of God if we are ever to thrive and rise to the fullness of our prophetic potential this has nothing to do necessarily with the fortitude to sin or to fall. It is just an inherent limitation that is in all men. The reality of the humanity of men, the humanity of men, you would notice in Revelations, and Ezekiel also had that vision of what we call theologically the four living creatures. These are a capture of the full dimensions that must find expression in man to fully reveal the glory of God. The four living creatures stand before the throne as a representation of all of the dimensions that represent holistic spiritual development. Number one is the face of the lion, talks of dominion and power and royalty. But if that is the only dimension you know and have, the side effect to manifesting that dimension alone is pride. The next phase becomes a balance to the first phase, the phase of a calf, that the purpose of power and authority is service. Are we together now? But if you have these two dimensions alone, it also has a side effect because being a calf alone will weary you to death. So it reminds you with the third phase that even though you are servant, you are also human, the face of the man. It puts a balance so that you do not stretch yourself above and beyond your capacity. And then when it reminds you that you are human, chances are excellent that if you dwell on your humanity, you will give unrestrained access to the flesh. Then it reminds you that although you are human, you are also divine, the face of the flying eagle. So these are dimensions that must be captured in our Christian experience to be balanced and to be holistic in our spiritual development. But then I'm interested tonight for the purpose of our discussion on the reality of our human nature. There is something about the weakness of man that if unassisted cannot produce the glory of God. The Bible is very clear as to the frailty of man. We considered that yesterday. That something about our weaknesses, our limitations, you find that expressly detailed in Psalm 51. Please give us Psalm 51. This was a, a very honest expression of the weakness of man. 
Can we look at that for a minute? Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. He said, blot out my transgressions. Uh -huh. It's a long reading. Please be patient. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. For against thee thee only have i sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest five behold i was shapen in iniquity remember we considered this yesterday and in sin did my mother conceive me he's saying there is an inherent flaw that has nothing to do with me acting out any sin there is a limitation that is enshrined in my humanity that cannot allow me to glorify God unassisted the reality of the humanity of men is is a factor that if not examined we will never appreciate the necessity for his mercy and we will never also be able to rise to our full prophetic potential if you're with me please say amen, amen. God's mercy therefore is a system of advantage that was given to man to help man rise and bring glory to the name of the Lord in spite of all of these defects that are enshrined in men. God had to put in this factor of his mercy so that regardless the limitations of men, we will still be able to birth the purposes of God. Are we together now? Yes. By the provision that his mercy gives and provides, we will be able to rise and become full expressions, I wrote here, of his expectations, regardless our humanity. So a quick recap that the mercy of God is a derivative of his love and his compassion. It is impossible for mercy to find expression without compassion. Hallelujah. Oftentimes you read in scripture that Jesus was moved with compassion. And I told us yesterday that mercy is an action word. You can feel the pain of another, that is compassion. But when it has to do with mercy, all through scripture, it is have mercy or show mercy. There is nothing like feel mercy in scripture. Mercy is always action. Hallelujah. But tonight, I am, I am particularly concerned about the administration of mercy. Because as powerful and as cheap, as free as the mercy of God is, you will be surprised that there are individuals in desperate need of his mercy who may never, never be able to receive of his mercy because they do not understand his system of administering mercy please follow very carefully my teaching begins now we need to understand how God designed his mercy to be administered several people have received um, for instance the COVID vaccine or any kind of vaccine at all when you come to receive a vaccine there is a system of administering it is that true yes you don't bring your head and say, can you put the syringe, just any part of my body. The most important thing is that it should get into my body. You may have a problem. Is that true? Yes, there is a system. So just because it is the mercy of God does not mean it works anyhow. We have to understand his system of administering mercy. And um, we find it scattered through scripture. Let's go to... Um, Psalm 51 and verse 17. Let me hurry for sake of time. Psalm 51 and verse 17. The Bible gives us a very interesting condition that defines a spiritual state that a man must assume to be a recipient of God's mercy. The sacrifices of God, it says, are a broken spirit. A broken spirit. It says, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. That means, God, in my studying you, I have found out that you are vulnerable to a kind of people. There is a kind of man that when you see, you cannot run away from. 
is, is almost like a, if I would use that expression for want of word, a weakness in God. That the psalmist in studying God, he found a weak point. That no matter how much God hardens his heart towards man, there is a posture spiritually that when you take, immediately you get his attention. And he says, anyone who assumes the position of a broken and a contrite spirit, he says, oh God, thou will not despise. Are we together now? So not everyone will truly and sadly be a recipient of God's mercy. There is a posture that any man must assume. Everywhere in scripture you see the administration of God's mercy. For running the delivery of God's mercy is brokenness. Please write it down. Brokenness is the name given to the spiritual state that any and every man must assume. To be a recipient of God's mercy. Psalm 34 and verse 18. Psalm 34 and verse 18. The Bible says the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. He said and save it such as be of a contrite spirit. Is that in your Bible? The Lord. It is impossible for him to be far from those that are of a broken heart and that those who will experience his salvation expressed as his mercy are those who are of a contrite spirit. Now scattered through scripture, the way we study scripture, as you know, um, the Bible essentially helps us to know God by um, revealing three components. Number one, the promises of God. Number two, the principles of the kingdom, what we call the mysteries of the kingdom. Then number three, prophecies. So every time you open your Bible to learn God, you find captured in scripture the promises of God, a representation of the boundaries of his commitment to the believer. Because God cannot be committed to the believer outside of the allowance that scripture provides. He is mighty and he is great, but he limits his dealings with men to the provisions that scripture allows. Are we together now? That means it is not just what you want that God does. It is what you want that is consistent with the provisions that scripture allows. And he has exalted his word even above his name. So you find promises. Number two, you find principles. The modus operandi of the kingdom. It gives you a capture of the ways of God. The methodologies of the kingdom captured in stories, captured in parables, captured in similitudes. So that when you study these parables and these stories, behind the stories are a revelation of the ways of God. Are we together? The Bible says the things that are written are for time. It says that they are for our learning. So that we through the comfort of scripture might find hope. Are we learning tonight? We're going to examine very quickly a story that captures, in my opinion, it is the most detailed capture of rebellion against authority and then how the mercy of God is administered. I want you to follow me very quickly as we go to Luke chapter 15 and examine a very popular story. We know it to be the story of the prodigal son. Luke 15. Let's begin our reading from verse 11. The Bible says, And he said, A certain man had two sons. Follow the story closely. The Bible says, And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And the Bible says, And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after... The younger son gathered all together and took off his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. There's no point to deal with this story and show you all the lessons that should be learned. But maybe I, I should just take a few seconds to explain something. This was the first decision he took outside the influence of his father. And it was disaster. That meant that all his results was credited to his connection to his father. 
The devil, knowing that his immunity and his strength was connected to his relationship, insisted to dissociate him from his father. And the first decision that he would take out of the influence of his father landed him in trouble. Same thing happened to Abraham and Lot. God called Abraham and the Bible says, and Lot went with him. The first decision Lot would make outside of the influence of Abraham landed him in Sodom. Hallelujah. Let's read on. Verse 13. The Bible says he went and wasted his substance with riotous living. 14 now. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land and he began to be in want. He went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his field to feed with swine. Look at the gradual degradation, degradation and decadence that was happening to this man. And then the Bible says, verse 16, and he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat and no man gave unto him. Next verse. When he came to himself. This is a very powerful revelation of what God put in men. The Bible never said the Holy Ghost spoke to him. The Bible never said an angel appeared before him. That means it is within the power of man to come to himself. You may not be able to help yourself, but you can come to the realization that you need help. Follow closely. This is the protocol of the administration of mercy. Please keep that scripture there. He came to himself and then he said, to who now? Himself. How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to eat and to spare and I perish with hunger? Can you see that sometimes hunger is a blessing? Because it sustains a unique ability to make you come to... There would be no need for this kind of intelligent discussion if there was plenty. The Bible says he came to himself. Follow closely. Verse 18. I will arise. He's speaking to himself now. So he had that ability. I will arise and go to my father. And I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. It took a lot of thoughtfulness to get to that point. To know the extent of his sin. That I have not just sinned against you. I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Say brokenness. Everywhere you find the mercy of God administered. You always find a broken and a contrite heart. Please keep that story there. Let's finish up. He says, I am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. 20. The Bible says he arose. He would have thought to himself and remain there. It is within your power to come to yourself. And it is within your power to begin to take a step that demonstrates brokenness. The Bible says he arose and he came to his father. Watch this now. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had... There you see our terminologies again. He never said he had mercy because mercy always flows from compassion. The father had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Verse 21. And the son said to him, Father, can you see that he was really determined? He said what he said to himself, he would say to the father. I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called your son. In the presence of such welcome from his father, many people would keep quiet and not say what they said they would say. But now he said, not even your honor would distract me. I am that broken. I have to let you know that I am broken. 22. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe. This is the character of mercy. And put it on him. Do you know he never said bath him? He said, bring forth, I don't care what condition. All that I need to see, I have seen. There is brokenness. Bring forth the best robe. 
put it on him and put a ring, a symbol of authority, put it on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill him and let us eat and be merry. Why? For this my son was dead. What was the father talking about? Dead? What killed him? When you read scripture, don't rush. A man is talking to a son who is alive. And hear what the father is saying. This my son was dead. That means you don't need to die to be dead. This my son. There is a condition that is equal to death even when you are alive. This young man satisfied that condition that the Bible calls death. What is it? Separation. Is that not in your Bible? That God's idea of death is not just cessation from living. That once you are outside of your connection with your source, the word Abba means source, sustainer, defender, protector. Once you cut away, you are dead. This my son was dead. What was the death? He left me. And the Bible says now he's alive. What gave him life? The connection. Hmm. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Are we learning tonight? 25. Now, we're about to learn another lesson. His elder brother was in the field. And he came and drew nigh to the house. And he heard music and dancing. Follow closely. Assume you are the elder brother. And he called one of the servants and asked what, what things, what these things meant. And he said unto him, thy brother is come. And thy father had killed the fatted calf because he had received him safe and sound. And he was, hmm. he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. What a good father. We talk about the children and forget the father. The father was good. Next verse. And he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgress I any time at thy commandments, and yet thou never gavest me mercy. How could I have been so close to you? As far as I'm concerned, I fulfilled the condition that would have made me a recipient of your mercy. And as close as I was with you all these years, in spite of proximity, I never truly benefited from your mercy. You can be so close to the point of mercy, but if you do not fulfill, he made one mistake. This was his mistake. I have served you and I did not transgress. It's called self-righteousness. So he believed that I am deserving of your mercy by reason of my flawlessness. He marked his script, graded himself, and demanded an award called mercy. The father is about to correct the young man now. Are we learning now? And yet, you never gave me a kid that I may make merry with my friends. Hmm. But as soon as this thy son was come, which had devoured thy living with harlots, and had killed for him. Look at how he's complicating. Are you seeing the detail? He's reminding the father. In case you have forgotten. Let me help you understand the kind of person you are showing mercy to. He didn't say one who was feeding with the swine. He found the most dangerous part of the story and brought it before the father. Thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. 31. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Look up, please. He said, It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again. Remember his definition of death now? Was lost and is found. Let me ask you a question. How many of the man's sons were dead? Hmm. 
Because we see that the results that follow those who die was bo on both the elder and the younger. The only difference was that one acted out his rebellion and his anger by leaving. The other one remained in the house but he was not broken. You need to understand this. When you understand this condition, you will know why so many people you pray for and say, Lord, are you blind? Are you not seeing this person? And yet it looks like they cannot. The condition for mercy is not service. No, he was serving in the house. The condition for mercy is not flawlessness. The young man did it. The moment the son satisfied that condition, I will arise and I will go to my father and I will say, Father, there is something I have recognized. My inadequacy. I have recognized my need for your influence. I have recognized that I cannot help myself. The father said, you've satisfied the condition. Stop. Believers, let me tell you, herein lies the mystery behind God's supposed commitment to the life of others. And it looks like God seems to handpick a few people. And you are wondering, God, why are you investing your time, your attention, your resources on this person? And I'm there and it's as if you are passing me. And I'm a Christian, I, I'm a churchgoer, I love you, I love my pastor, and it looks like things are not working. I show you the system of administering mercy. When the strength of God comes and it finds strength, it will go back. The strength of God comes looking for brokenness. Do you know what brokenness is? Brokenness is a state of admittance. Of your inability to help yourself out of your personal resources that you are inadequate by default by reason of the fallen nature you don't have to wait to act it out and learn a lesson from your pain that by default you recognize that if at any point you are unassisted by heaven the result will always be disaster so you don't have to wait until you act and then surprise yourself it is a revelation that is ever before you that God is not just a matter of Christianity. God is not just a matter of church. He is your life. If at any point you are separate from his influence, whatever decision that is made from that standpoint, like the prodigal son, like Lot, will always take you to disaster. Brokenness. The mercy of God is ever searching for brokenness. Brokenness among preachers, brokenness among business people, brokenness among all kinds of people. So you can find out that a young man can be smoking and drinking and lying down under a bridge and wondering. But in his heart he's saying, if there is a God, I know I do not deserve to see your face. Suddenly Jesus will leave a prayer warrior who is rolling in a room. And come and appear before someone who is under a bridge and say, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. If you do not know what God looks for in men to help men, we can continue shadow boxing in self-righteousness and hoping that we will find his help. Are we learning? In Daniel chapter 4, let me hurry for time. Daniel chapter 4, let's look at verse 34. This was um, the story of Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, he had a dream about himself and the disaster that was going to come to him. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him that liveth forever. This was after seven years of becoming an animal. Remember, he was so haughty, he lifted himself and believed that he was God until he was turned to an animal for seven years. This was the prayer of a repentant man. Watch brokenness, even from a king. Are you ready? And I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Next verse, please. 
and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say unto him what doest thou at the same time my reason returned unto me and for the glory of my kingdom my honor and brightness return unto me and my counselors and my lord sought unto me and i was established in my kingdom and excellent majesty was added to me when he acknowledged that truly there was a god above him let me tell you this many many believers are unable to receive of the mercy of god because there is something about the nature of man that would not admit that you are limited Dearly beloved, I hope you were blessed by this message. Do not keep the video to yourself. Share to as many as you can to help them bless. Check our homepage for more of our messages. Subscribe to the channel. Comment on it. Like it. See you on our next video. Bye. Pray. Pray. Pray for your destiny. Salaska de Bashka na kata branda kate katos, kate branda kata bako tos koto pre kate kene kata. The phase of development, Lord, grant me the discipline.